Greetings travelers, welcome back to House DM. Today we're going to be making some dungeon tiles. And we're doing it from this EVA foam. Comes in at about a half inch thickness, which is great in the northwest because we just can't get half inch XPS foam up here. So this stuff will do nicely. Now this stuff's pretty freaking indestructible, hence the thumbnail. I've definitely dented or chipped some scattered terrain that I've made from XPS foam in the past. So this EVA foam is pretty hardy. You could throw this stuff at a wall and it's not going to dent or crack or break or anything like that. You might scuff some paint, but paint's an easy fix. Also, don't throw your terrain at walls, maybe. Now you can see I've already started to cut off these little puzzle piece end bits. But don't toss them, because later in this video, I'll show you a little sneak peek, so to speak, of what I plan to do with these. I figured I'd spare you by drawing all of these tiles onto the foam off camera. But this is just based off of a project I started on Dungeon Scrawl. It's a free online like dungeon creation tool. It's pretty cool. You should definitely check it out. Before you begin this step, make sure you have a fresh blade. And I also recommend you extend your utility knife blade as long as you can. Really helps make these drawing cuts nice and clean. I don't know if you're also like me, but seeing all of these pieces cut out, my brain was just unlocking this creative energy. And I was like, oh, I can make stairs and columns and I just need to keep going. The possibilities are endless here. Now, I don't own a hot wire table yet, so I'm using this wood burning tool. And you can kind of change off one of the bits with this X Acto knife. Came together in a kit. I'll put a link in the description if you want to get one for yourself, but I think these are actually cheaper to buy from your local craft store over Amazon. So, hey, if you want to support the channel and help me get a kickback from buying it through my link, that's awesome. But if you're tight on a budget, go to your local craft store, get those coupons, and get it cheaper. I've lost track of how much I've talked about grid versus gridless on this channel, but I don't really like to draw grids in this one circumstance. I feel as though it actually makes sense to have a grid because, you know, dungeon tiles, stone, pathways, and whatnot. But even with the grid drawn, I'm still going to gravitate towards the close, near, far distances from index card RPG. You don't need to trace you know every flagstone out first i just was sitting there waiting for the hot knife to heat up so i figured eh i might as well go through and just trace all these real quick i created these tiles for a viking death squad five room dungeon i wrote up a whole module for it but i don't feel quite comfortable sharing it just yet until i play tested it and then i'll probably make a video sharing all the details there But you can see these look pretty good with just a ballpoint pen. I just wanted those lines to be a little deeper and more distinct. Now, quick word of advice, definitely test this out on a spare piece of foam first. You don't want to cut too deep. And with the hot part of the blade and then, you know, the blade being sharp, you can cut through this stuff pretty easily. So you have to find the right balance of putting just enough pressure on the blade to actually get a good cut. And then also not putting too much pressure on that you cut all the way through and sever your tile in half. I think this step is crucial and it really sells the look, even though I'm recording on an iPhone 8. Next up, we want to bring that line down the edges of the tiles as well to kind of give it more of that 3D feel. Um, I was just pushing into it with the blade. This worked, but I did end up going back later and doing a drawing cut with the hot knife just to make that line a little deeper. You'll see I'll demonstrate that on this bigger tile here. Now it's really hard to tell, but if you look super closely at this video, you can see that the back end of the blade is hotter, so it cuts much easier, whereas the point of the blade, because it's so fine, the heat transfer from the hot knife to the foam causes that point to cool down quickly, and it's not going to cut through the foam as easily. So if you're going quick like me here, where you're being impatient, 
you're going to find that you have to either hold the blade there longer or just be better about those drawing cuts. So this took me about 45 minutes and I didn't use the full foam square. You didn't really see that in the earlier part, but this is probably about three quarters of one of those squares. Um, and that also includes, you know, tracing the shapes, cutting out the shapes, then doing the ballpoint pen tracing, adding the grid, using the hot knife, etc. All in about 45 minutes. Not too much work. And these look pretty solid. Got a mini there for scale. Technically, I would even say that these are usable at the table right now, but they are missing the ruined textured dungeon aesthetic. But we can fix that up, no problem. What I love about XPS foam is it's really easy to add all sorts of cool textures. With this EVA foam, however, you can see here, I've kind of gone and cut through it with that hot knife, and it actually works pretty well this way. If you just try to make cuts with a knife that's not hot, I think it'll still work. It's just, you have to work a little bit harder. This stuff is very, um, it's very elastic. So even if you cut into it, it'll kind of try to mold back into its regular shape. But when you use a hot knife, the hot knife helps it to hold the shape of whatever your cut is. You're kind of cauterizing the foam, which is a really grim way to think about it, but it seems to work really effectively. Earlier I mentioned that you could buy this wood burning tool online or at your local craft store. You can also get these foam squares online. I have a couple other links in the description that you can check them out there. This stuff though, you can kind of find these things on the side of the street. I don't know if you live somewhere similar to where I live where people just toss out all sorts of things, but I'm always on the lookout for craft supplies or foam or things like this that I can turn into something for my, you know, tabletop role-playing games. Now, I'm pretty sure this goes without saying, but you're essentially burning plastic here, and you should definitely be doing this in a very well-ventilated area or wear something like a respirator, because, yeah, this stuff's toxic. Now, if you've been paying attention, you could see I'm doing all sorts of different techniques for getting different textures between doing these drawing cuts to add cracks to the tiles, you know, using the side of the blade to kind of burn the foam a bit, or do the sort of like poke and cut in the middle sections. You'll see that I have a pair of tweezers here too that, you know, if you got some tweezers, you can kind of pull the foam out and that will give you a nice little hole or crater in the EVA. This is also a really cool pattern I recommend trying where you cut diagonally down one tile and you draw that crack through other tiles. Probably one of my more favorite details that I've done with these. My wood burning kit came with these other points you could add to the tool. I got a little tired of using the knife, so figured I'd try something new. And this piece was really good for making very uniform holes. You'll see I begin to kind of like just quickly sketch and dot a bunch of holes in it. And this is what I would akin to be similar to when you're using a aluminum foil ball on the pink XPS foam and you know you roll it around and get that texture. You can't really do that very easily on the EVA. Even if you push super hard, it just the elasticity of the foam just pushes back. But with this piece here, you're able to get kind of a similar effect. Similar, not not the same as the, you know, good old fashioned rolled up aluminum foil ball. Now, I wish I could tell you that you can't really mess up in this stage, but I definitely messed up right here. Don't don't do this, especially if you have the foam that does have a texture on the bottom. That texture when melted just kind of looks and feels weird on the tiles. I was feeling, you know, experimental and I wanted to try and see if it would be cool to melt those edges and I kind of regret it. So 
yeah, I mean, try try it out for yours. Maybe you'll have better luck than me, but because that texture isn't like flat, like the top part of these tiles, it just kind of made this weird choppy edge. And that's not really what I was going for. Well, that took a while, but the end result is much better than I was anticipating. The funny part is you don't see in this video at all the part where I tried to use a heat gun to use the aluminum foil ball technique and <laughs> completely ruined not just the, you know, the little cuts in the holes in the EVA foam, but I also ruined my grid. I actually had to go back and cut the grid back into these tiles. So yeah, don't, don't use a heat gun. Learn from my mistakes. Well, now we get to paint, and that's always fun. Here's some gray. I've got some suede and tan colors here too for some highlights. I also wanted to experiment with a bit more color, so I got this brick red, and I had a blue laying around. I think it's like a cerulean bright blue color. I like to use the most inexpensive paints when it comes to painting terrain, just because there's so much more surface area, and you'll just get better bang for your buck. I didn't like how bright that gray was, so I'm using some Mars black paint here to make it a little bit darker. And then once that's mixed up enough, I'm just gonna go in and do a good old overbrush. For overbrushing, get a good amount of paint on there, but not so much that it will pull into the uh, cracks and crevices. You wanna keep those parts dark and just get the paint on the top parts. So while I'm painting all of these, if you like these longer form videos, please let me know in the comments. I know this one's like, I mean, I'm editing it right now, but this seems like quite a longer video than I'm used to. I hope it's valuable. So if it is, you know, throw me a like or let me know in the comments. Also, let me know if you don't like the longer form videos. I could easily cut this down to be, you know, a standard 10 minute video, but if you want to help me continue to make content and you've already liked and subscribed, Something else that will really help is to just watch my videos all the way through to the end. Thank you very much. Now, if you're a member of the tabletop crafting community, you might remember this technique from Lucas over at Bard's Craft. I think he's doing a lot of bushcraft videos now, uh, but he used to make a ton of tabletop RPG crafting content. Really enjoyed his, his videos. Um, and yeah, I shamelessly stole this from him. This is a just a piece of Douglas fir bark. Get a really sharp blade and just go about dicing this stuff up. Ideally, you'd use something like a kitchen knife, but I don't have a crappy one laying around for, you know, cutting up dried Douglas fir bark. <laughs> but this Mora knife will do fine. If you don't have a Mora knife, like, definitely get a Mora knife. Super affordable blade, and they're really easy to maintain. But yeah, for those of you who are still here and haven't left to go watch all of Lucas's crafting videos, we're gonna take this bark with all the various sizes and chunks of it and mix it with some white glue. You're just gonna take the Elmer's glue and just, you know, I, I didn't know what I was doing yet here. I'm like, is this gonna work with the foam? Is it gonna fall off? How much glue should I use? The correct answer to that is yes, 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 and a lot. Um, so put more glue than I did. This is me just testing it out. You know, I'm sprinkling it on top here. And you're looking for, you know, good coverage. You're gonna shake some of the stuff off and Here's the moment where I realized, yeah, I should probably put a lot more glue for this. So I go and just kind of cover this whole thing in random spots. You don't want the whole thing to be flocked. Not like my uh, grass wilderness terrain video I made. That one I did want everything to be flocked, but I still want to be able to see the tiles on this one. So that's why I use that old beat up paintbrush to kind of spread the, the glue into spots where I felt would look good. Another unintentional benefit of doing this is it helps to give this sort of embossed texture that you don't normally get with this kind of foam. 
Remember, we're not working with XPS where you can just do the foil ball technique. But this stuff, once I painted over it, made the EVA foam look just as good as XPS foam. And that's kind of what we're going for here. So I sprayed this big piece off camera with this watered down glue. I'll show you what it looks like in a second, but I do go back and record a clip spraying down all of the other little tiles. I think you saw that in my opening section of this video. But yeah, definitely like soak this thing. You can see some parts that are kind of dry. Soak it in PVA glue, like hella glue. The best way to get flock to not come off is to really let that that would absorb all of this glue. Now I'm sure a couple of you probably already noticed that I kind of screwed up in the order here. Ideally, I would have glued the bark down first and then painted them gray, but you know, I um, didn't really think about that. So we're gonna go back after this next bit and paint over it after it's all dry. Earlier in this vid, I promised I'd share with you my idea for these off cuts and spare pieces, but I was definitely inspired by Sebastian over at Atmos Seeker. Definitely check out his channel, he's got some cool stuff. And I'm gonna make some stairs and other scatter terrain with these. That'll be in a future video. Now that that glue is fully dry, you can go back with that gray paint and just kind of brush over all of the, um, the bark chips. And by doing that, it'll really start to pick up all of those nice details. I'll keep some of it unpainted here so you can see the difference between painted bark flock and non-painted. I did record this video over a couple days and on one of those days, I actually ran into this blue cerulean paint on the side of the road and figured, huh, I guess I should use that for my video. So I don't know how easy it is to get that basics blue cerulean, but you could always just use the Craft Smart paint as well. You can see I'm just doing an overbrush here with the blue in between the bark bits. And then I'm actually gonna use that brick red to paint over the bark chips to give it just, you know, some variations in color. I've always been making dungeon, you know, scatter and other things with just grays and blacks and that looks great but I really wanted these ones to have a bit more color to them. I think I also got this brush at a garage sale. Like really don't underestimate estate sales for crafting supplies. I found some great deals on supplies that I typically wouldn't buy because they're just so expensive. So Definitely check those out. Buy second hand. Save some money. All right, on to the dry brushing stage. Gonna use some tan, a makeup brush from the 99 cent store, which is super dirty and I probably should have cleaned better, and proceed to screw up my tiles because I have too much paint on this brush. Yeah, you want to like really make sure that you don't have any paint on it to get the dry brushing effect to work or else you're going to get some streaking like this and it just doesn't look as good. Me being me, I of course picked up a different brush to try dry brushing with thinking that <laughs> it was definitely the tool and not the user, but you'll see I go back to the, um, the makeup brush because the surface area is bigger and some of these tiles are pretty large and that brush that I'm using right now is a little bit, a little bit too small. It's great for these two by two pieces. You'll see here, that's the proper amount of paint because it's just getting the highlights of those, um, those bark chips and the edges really helps it pop. Damn. That looks freaking good. All right, 20 more to go. Here's an awesome side-by-side -side of the streaking on the left and then proper dry brushing on the right. I really like this big piece with just the red and the grays. 
and I was going back and forth on whether I should add the blue to it and decided ultimately against it. Figured I would just keep this one how it is. But you'll see here I'm still going over with another dry brush and then you'll often see me pick this up and kind of turn it to the side because I'm trying to see whether the dry brushing paint actually hits the bark chips. So you can see it right here. And that's kind of what I'm looking for when I'm checking for full coverage. A lot of these steps take quite a bit of time, so while you're working on your own dungeon tiles, you can always catch up on my other videos. And here's a tile that has both the red and blue on it and has been dry brushed, which it looks pretty good. And I think it'll look even better once we add our black wash to it. Speaking of black wash, I made this and uh, put it into an old butter, ghee butter container. Those, those containers are great. But this is just watered down black paint with a tiny drop of dish soap. You can kind of see some of the suds on there and I'm just soaking this thing in it. This black wash really helps tone down the colors and tie the whole piece together. Doing anything with paint, or in this case a black wash, can get pretty messy, so definitely recommend laying down some old newspaper or ads, especially if you're like me and you don't actually have a proper gaming table and you're borrowing from a good friend. To prevent pooling and getting like a bunch of uh, kind of black puddly marks, just grab some like Kleenex or paper towel and dab up the excess. Like that. I was a little bit nervous about applying the wash to this big piece because I really liked how the colors looked. But to combat that, just make sure before you apply a wash that your piece is just bone dry. Since this wash is mostly water, I ended up just setting them up in front of a little fan and it takes a while for them to dry. But while they're drying, I'll, uh, I'll go play uh, some D&D with my cat. She's actually really good at rolling dice. Oh my gosh, you were so close, Nan. And here we are, the final form. I honestly think that the uh, wash did a really good job of getting into those dark crevices there. And here I'll just hold up a couple of the pieces so you can see the detail. It really helped blend and kind of tone down the blue and the reds a bit. So thanks for sticking with me all the way through to the end. As thanks, here's me taking the tiles and putting them to good use. Enjoy. <laughs>